Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 49 of Nostalgia Talk. I'm James. You know who I am. And joining me this time for Nostalgia Talk is the wonderfully talented Pam Arciero. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to meet you, James. Nice Hello, to meet you everybody. as well. <laughs> Now, for anyone who doesn't know, Pam is a puppeteer whose work can be seen on many different shows. She plays Grungetta on Sesame Street. She played Leona on Between the Lions. Uh, uh, which one of them on Eureka's Castle? I get them mixed up. Oh, uh, I was uh, a Quagmire and thank I you. was Emma the Fat Mouse. <laughs> okay, yeah. Bog and Quagmire, I tend to mix them up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and also- Bog's on... the boy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That makes sense. I'll try, I'll try to remember that. I watched that show kind of sporadically. Yeah. Uh, and also has been on Allegra's Window, was a director on the show Ubi, and speaking of directing things, is artistic director for the O'Neill Puppetry Conference. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a big welcome to, uh, to Pam on Nostalgia Talk. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Lovely to be here. Awesome. So uh, let's begin with uh, going back in time. Uh, what got you interested in puppetry? Oh, um, I was a dance major at the University of Hawaii, and I'm originally born and raised in Hawaii. And wow. um, uh, Kermit Love came to teach the summer puppetry course. And I had a couple of friends who were into the puppetry program. And I thought, puppetry, hmm, interesting. You know, I always like making stuff, so maybe I'll like this. So Kermit came and he taught a class. We did a production at the end. And Kermit Love is the man who built Big Bird. He built Big Bird. He designed and built Snuffleupagus and many other characters. So he was a puppet builder and designer. Um, and he loved puppets, like just loved the art form. And he brought, taught me that love. I caught it from him, really. But just the fact that this is an art form that you can perform in, you can sing, you can dance, you can act. And then you can build them too, you can make them. So if you're, you know, as puppeteers, we tend do tend to be jack of all trades, but we like all the artistic forms. We're kind of Renaissance people in order to be a puppeteer really, because you have to do so much. And you, you basically, if you don't love it, you are not gonna stay in this business. So he brought, taught me this love and here was this thing. And I was, suddenly decided that is exactly what I have to do. Um, so that got me into puppetry, which then I went and got a graduate degree from the University of Connecticut. I have um, in puppetry and that's how my whole life sort of took off. <laughs> nice. And Kermit Love, because uh, that, that's a name that gets brought up from time to time on this show. He was like he brought in so many different puppeteers like he was he basically discovered Kevin Clash. He discovered Noel McNeil, another past guest on the show. He discovered, I think, Jim Krupa, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. OK, so, yeah, that, that's interesting that um, here's a guy that's worked with Jim Henson for a long time. And I know that because I saw the documentary Being Elmo and, right. and, I, and I saw that Kermit was the one who for, for anyone who's confused by what I'm saying, I'm not referring to Kermit the Frog. I know it's a lot easier uh, for a kid to understand. Oh, yeah. Kermit the Frog discovered me. Uh, <laughs> no, we call him Kermit the person. <laughs> <laughs> We've always referred to him as Kermit the person. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it, it's so interesting that somebody who worked with Jim for many, many, many years uh, was the one who usually was discovering these puppeteers. And in the case of Kevin and Jim Krupa and Noel McNeil was having them on other shows before Sesame Street. And right. usually that's. Yeah. OK. Uh, what was your first ever puppeteering gig? Um, I actually, my first ever puppeteering gig in a professional stance was Little Shop of Horrors. Um, oh, I, nice. I, um, Marty and I had met, Marty Robinson and I had met at an audition for, Ses for Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. um, and we just fell in love with each other right then and there and had to work together. So he actually got Snuffleupagus out of that audition. And I was told I'd be called again, which I didn't believe, but they did call me. <laughs> Don't um, call us, we'll call you. Exactly. Yeah, we, well, there was, you know, there's 200 people. Who, why would they call you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just starting my career in the film industry and like I am kind of between positions a lot and I'm thinking to myself, oh God, I'm going to be stuck in this for a long time. No, no, it, it depends, but you make your best friends in those kind of positions. So don't oh, yeah. forget. And they all move up and that's exactly what's happened to me. So, um, uh, Marty and I, Marty said, I have this project if you have time. Now I was still in graduate school. So um, 
I would come down on the weekends and I just helped them do a few things on the puppets for the very first incarnation of Little Shop of Horrors at the, um, down on Union Square, around Union Square. I can't think of the name of the theater at the moment, but anyway, the Orpheum, of course I can, because uh, I went there a lot. So he was opening it at the Orpheum, this little, little off, 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 off Broadway show. So I helped him cut out some leaves for the vines that were coming down. And I helped him glue a few things and figure out a few things on the plants. And then I went back to school. So um, I was then out of school, graduated and, and Little Shop was a big hit and they were moving to London. The first cast was moving to London. So he said, do you want to come down and work? So I ended up being a, the second puppeteer. Anthony Asbury was then in the plant. And then we have a second puppeteer along with the main puppeteer who helped with the different puppet aspects of the show and that's and, and this was for the stage show right the stage show because yeah, yes. every, every time because every time i think of little shop of horrors i think of the film yeah right this was this is and this is what came out you know this was the stage show that ran before they did the film mm -hmm. um and before it went to big broadway again a few years back um and then during then i auditioned and got a show called the great space coaster mm -hmm. and kermit was building the puppets for that as well so I auditioned and I got the characters um, Fluffy and Puppy, and there were the Huggles, there were three of them. Kevin was Scruffy, so we did that show. So I was doing that show during the day and doing Little Shop at night. So after about a month, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I have no, <laughs> I'm dying, I'm going to sleep, I can't. I, you know, sleeping every spare moment that you could um, because it was just, you were up till two o'clock in the morning then getting up for a 6 a.m. call. So it was- Holy it was, crap. Yeah. Wow. So it's, by the time you get home from doing a, a show at night, you're done it, everything's put away and you're ready to go home at 11, 1130. By the time you get home, it's 1230. By the time you relax and come down off the show high, it's one, two in the morning. Oh, and show yeah. um, television usually starts at the latest at 830 in the morning. You Very often, 8 o'clock or 730 in the morning, you have to be there. So in order to make that happen, it was a very um, tiring time. So um, I left Little Shop at, for, um, after, after about a month of doing that. I just couldn't handle it anymore. But the TV gig was you know, what I wanted to do and I knew was also paying a lot more. So, because um, theater is never, never pays what television pays. Mm. Um, and we like to say we do television so we can do theater at night because that's exactly <laughs> what it is. Television well, that affords you the luxury of doing live theater. Yeah. And that and that's why they invented the term "don't quit your day job." <laughs> right. <laughs> so after a Great Space Coaster, uh, maybe so was Sesame Street after the Great Space Coaster. I got the Great Space Coaster first, but that same summer after that we'd done the first um, season of Great Space Coaster is when I went. Um, I auditioned. By the end of the summer, I'd been hired onto Sesame. Mm -hmm. um, after that. And I think that was in 82 or 83. I always get those years mixed up. <laughs> mm. Okay. So, so you... um, yeah, I think my first season officially was 83. So it must have been 83. Okay. Um, although Marty swears it's 82. We have to figure that out. Um, well, it's it, er, early 80s, regardless. <laughs> early 80s. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it was the time. It was the sign of the times. <laughs> right. So what Sesame had been doing or the Muppets were doing to find people was um, we had a workshop every week. Mm -hmm. um, and this was again, early eighties. So if my memory's vague, those of you who are there, forgive me. Um, but the workshop was being led by Richard Hunt and Jane Henson basically every week. And um, sometimes Jerry would stop in and teach us about voices. It was quite an amazing workshop, but the way they auditioned people was because there was nobody had home cameras then, right? It was three thousand dollars to buy a home video unit, which I did eventually just to practice because you know what we do is so difficult and to only learn on the job is very hard. But that was the only way in those days, really you learned on the job. But so anyway, the audition happened. There were 300 people we started with and there was a workshop once a week. Um, and you never knew if you were going to be invited back to the workshop. Um, they didn't tell you at the end of the workshop. So I think the workshops are on like a Thursday night okay. and they were about four hours or maybe Thursday afternoon into the evening, four or five hours. So the workshops, and, they, they sound a little bit like survivor. Yeah. 
that well that's auditions right when you yeah, audition exactly. something auditioning is survivors you know uh survivors not interesting to me because i go through that all the time i went through that all the time why would i you know, my my, my yeah. dad and my dad and my sister love Survivor, so I have a feeling that if they're listening, this will be very interesting for them. So you go, and it's you know it, you don't know if you're coming back, and the phone call was always Monday. Mm -hmm. So on Monday you'd hang around, and there were no cell phones. Remember, this was you had to sit by the phone and wait to pick it up, or your answering machine got it. Mm -hmm. But um, and that was the only way you couldn't check. You had to actually go home and find out if the call came in. Um, and so for one once a week for about three and a half or four months, that's what I did. And we started with 300 and at the end they were looking for a Grangetta and there was two of us left that last week. Mm -hmm. And that was Camille Bonara and myself. And Camille was hired the next season because she's an excellent, funny, wonderful puppeteer as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, her, her characters cracked me up. Yeah. So she, um, but anyways, that happened and then they at the end of that audition um it was funny because in that audition was jim henson john stone dulcie singer lisa simon i don't think jane was there and richard wasn't there but it was all the big guns of sesame street mm -hmm. and that and then they brought you in for a final audition and i thought um and on my way to that audition i uh i was obviously incredibly nervous and incredibly concerned and feeling incredibly unable to, to pull this off. And um, I'm walking down the street and this homeless guy looks up at me and you know, I'm nervous about the way I look, everything, the whole nine yards. This homeless guy looks up at me and says, hey, Miss Piggy, what happened? You forget your hairbrush? <laughs> Ouch. Crying, I was like, "Leave me alone!" I was so, I was so shocked. I was like, "He was psychic. He knew I was going to audition for the Muppets." And, and, this, and, the, and, and this was in New York, right? It was in New York City. Yeah. Did you beat him in up? The early '80s, which you have to remember was really tough. Mm. Was a well, tough city. Well, did you at least beat him up? No. Oh. He just said thank you and walked on. <laughs> I mean, if I mean, I I went to a high school where there was where I would see fights a lot, and I would hear people going, "Fight, fight." Fight, fight, no. fight. I was never like that because I felt I would get in trouble, but that's one of those moments where I'd be tempted to. No, no. I mean, he was clearly of another planet and I wasn't gonna, you know, I wasn't gonna argue that. And my attitude was I was going to the best, best chance I had in my life, you know, mm -hmm. to get something that I wanted. So if he want, it was just a funny incident to me. And then I went in and um, after the audition, they liked what I did and I said, okay, is there a callback or and, and Dulcie Singer just says to me, no, why don't you just come in September and you can try the character. And that was it. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so I've been wow. there since, you know, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah, I think, years. yeah, I was taught when I had Marty on oh. here, uh, he was saying that he's been there the longest. I feel like you, Marty, Noel and David have all been there the longest. Yeah. Carmen comes in real, real close after that, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Carmen was another one who came in under Kermit. Right, right. I forgot so, about. I, I forgot to mention her. <laughs> you know, there's a there's there's a, a group of us who did start with Kermit, and and even Marty. You know, Marty was trained by Kermit. They didn't necessarily get along great initially. They did eventually, <laughs> but he, you know, he was there. He was Snuffy's caretaker. So if you did mm -hmm. Snuffy, you were always working with Kermit. Mm -hmm. Um, but. Yeah, a bunch of us all came in under that that time period in the early eighties. Yeah, Marty's Marty's been there the longest. Bryant Young is another person who you don't hear about that often. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's I actually think... been there the longest. He was mm -hmm. hired the year before, or maybe two years before Marty. I think that's right, actually. Yeah, and for any of the it, listeners who don't know who Bryant Young is, Bryant Young is basically Snuffy's Heine. Yeah, he's that's the back end of the yeah. Snuffleupagus. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and maybe other ancillary characters here and there, but the years, mostly yeah. mostly known for Snuffy's rear end. I uh, yeah. yeah, he's the back end of Snuffy, and he was a ballet dancer most of his life. Oh, um, so so he's got that. So he's got that nailed. You know. Yeah, so that's why the back end worked right for him. He was all about the movement, mm -hmm. um, and he still has been flying in to do it. So he is really the last man standing the longest um cast member of sesame street right now the longest working and that then really marty. does sound like survivor <laughs> and then marty and then myself i believe i'm next in line 
-hmm. And then um, I think David was hired for a summer thing. Mm -hmm. So he comes in next. And then I think Carmen. Okay. I think that's the order. I don't know. So somebody will probably correct us. Um, So your first ever thing that was filmed for Sesame Street, was it with Grangetta or was it with like a one shot character or a right hand or something? It was a one shot character. Um, It was North with Northern Calloway, who was Mm -hmm. David on Sesame Street. So it goes way back. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was, uh, they gave Kevin and I, uh, a brother and sister, Crystal and Mario, I think their names were. And oh, yeah, you know, I've, I've seen them. Yeah. So that was our first thing that we did. They brought me in to do that. I think we only did a couple of shows, but Mario was a fat blue character. And I think Crystal was a two handed lavender. Yeah. It kind of looked like uh, something out of the movie Flashdance. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, we did that. That was the first day. And then I did. Uh, right hands and and some ba- a couple background characters. That was my first day. I think it was pretty okay. amazing. Hmm. Um, and we used to run the, in those days. It was uh, we did 110 shows a, a year, so mm-hmm. we ran from September through like February. Generally speaking, was our calendar. Right. Um, we ran about four and a half or five months a year doing the show, which is real different than what we do now. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I because th- uh, Lou Berger came on this show and he was saying that he came up, they were trying to cut the show down. Uh, when he started as head writer, they were going to cut the show down and they're like, okay, we're going to do 25. And he's like, no, uh, no, you got to do 26. And they're like, well, why 26? That's a stupid number that you hardly ever use. And he says, because there's 26 letters of the alphabet. Right. And that's clever. That's creative. Yeah. One episode for yeah. The way I heard the story was he looked at them and said, um, which letter of the alphabet do, you do want we want to fire? Fly? Yeah, <laughs> that's what, that was his story too. Yeah. Um, he apparently told me that he used a little bit more colorful language that uh, sounded a little bit like the because word fire. Because we had gone from 110 and then I think we went one year to about 80 and then we went to 55 and we were at 55 for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then they came in and said, we're going to do 25. Mm. And it was like, oh, my God. You know, so, um, yes, that's the famous Lou Berger story. He's a great guy. Oh, Listen. yeah. Lou, Lou, Lou's awesome. Uh, if you'd like, I can uh, tell him hi for you. We talk regularly. Do you really? Oh, sure. yeah. Like, he, like do. Um, now I've just started working on this TV show kind of behind the scenes. And every time something new happens, at least that I'm allowed to talk about, he's usually always the first person I tell. Oh, wow. What TV show are you working on? Uh, it's called From. It's a show that's shot uh, in the suburbs of Nova Scotia. Uh, I can't really talk. That's about right. It. Oh, that's right. Okay, You're yeah. up in Canada. I forgot. I was thinking you were in in. Uh, for some reason, I thought you were in Brooklyn, but that's just me. Uh- <laughs> hey, yeah, I mean, I do love the city a lot. I live in a tiny suburb, but. <laughs> nice. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, this. Well, show congratulations on getting a, a show up there. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I work in the art department, so I kind of help oh, out. Oh, that's, with set that's design. a wonderful place to start. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's exhausting. Yeah. Like this week, I went from Dartmouth to Beaver Bank, Beaver Bank to Dartmouth, vice versa, back and forth, and then back home to Fall River again, which is in this tiny, tiny community. Yeah. And, um, so uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's really it's really fun. I'm having a good time. Good. Well, you know that that uh, uh, the film industry and television starts early always. So you're yeah. always out early and stays late. I mean, that's just the way we work. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I did a student film when I was in film school where um, we were doing two days because that's how long our instructor gave us. And our first day call time was four thirty in the morning because we had to get some evening shots and it was uh-huh. like, it was like the middle of fall so you know <laughs> cold <laughs> yeah exactly yes. um cold but satisfying to be there for and uh, so we get there 4:30 in the morning and we finish i think around 12 hours later maybe a little bit later than that and then the next day call time was i think two o'clock in the afternoon we were done at 1 a.m we actually um there was a shoot we did once that we stayed over 24 hours for Sesame Street. Uh, no, it was a okay. um, it was an outside Henson project that was directed by Brian Henson. Oh wow! Yeah, 24. We literally hours. were sleeping, taking turns sleeping <laughs> in the dressing room, and then going oh, out to finish what we were doing. 
um, there was a time crunch on it. It had to be done in that period of time. So we just stayed until it was done. Mm. And literally we came in at 8.30 in the morning. I think we went home like 8.30 on a Tuesday morning and went home at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning and literally had worked straight through. Mm. That's that's uh, yikes. Yeah, that's showbiz. Yeah, that's the way it works. Yeah, exactly. Um, So speaking of uh, working in films, um, Marty Robinson told me that his first performance as Telly after Brian left was in Follow That Bird. Was that your first time doing Grangetta? Um, I actually didn't do, uh, I only did the voiceover for it because they Whoa. didn't, because I was so new, they didn't mm-hmm. want to pay for another person to come up, you know, I mean, budget wise, it just made more sense because it was just a couple of, uh, there was just a couple of lines, scenes that she was in. Mm-hmm. So I think, <clears throat> I don't remember who did her, someone else did her and then I came in and um, looped the lines, I, I dubbed the lines in. So technically, yes, that was my first performance as her, but only vocally. Okay. So you didn't uh, actually co- uh, come to Canada and do that film? No, I did not. No, okay. I didn't come to Canada till um, we did a special for Jim Henson. Um, his 50th birthday party was up there in Canada and we were doing a Jim Henson 30th anniversary special. I think mm. it was of the Muppets. I know and somebody we- who worked on that. Huh? Besides puppeteers, I know oh. uh, somebody who worked behind the scenes. Like I know quite a few of the puppeteers who have talked about that project. Yes, right. But, um, so that I think was my first time, was it? No, I'd been to Canada before for other reasons. Okay. I had worked with a puppeteer named Nikki Tilro. So um, she was a very dear friend, loved mm. her. Um, but anyway, so. Um, so, so, so yeah, you just did the voiceover for Grangetta? Yeah, at that time. Wow. I did tend to grow, yeah. Mm. So. I remember. But Mar- nonetheless, I got a credit. It was the first time I saw my name in any credits <laughs> by in the in the theater. It was so it's exciting. so that's so funny because on the Muppet Performer credits on Sesame Street, your name is always first. Last name of A, baby. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> well, that that's a lucky. Last name. <laughs> yeah. So it goes like Pam Sierra, uh, Jennifer Barnhart. Barnhart yeah. Um, maybe a couple more people after. Uh, Sometimes Billy, Billy Barkhurst. Depends so, what show it is, sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you're you're the real big star of Sesame Street. You're having your name first in the credits. <laughs> and Matt Vogel's always last. So, <laughs> and yet he plays one of the. He plays like he's the everybody, star. but he he's, he's got the V last name. <laughs> but you either want to be first or last because that's what people see, you know. <laughs> All I'm hearing is Grover. I do not want to be last in line. That skit with Grover where he's <laughs> debating as to him being first in line. He's like, I do not want to be last. And so every time he's first, everyone turns away. Yes, that's right. Turn the other direction. <laughs> yeah. But with what we were talking about with Sesame Street movies and you not technically being there for the filming of Follow That Bird. Yeah. It's too, it's too bad Grungetta wasn't in Elmo and Grouchland. Like, it would have been Yeah, I don't know her. what happened with that. The writers wrote her out and um i don't know exactly why but it didn't make any sense to me since she was one of the main grouches but yeah like they could have honestly gone with them to Grouchland. it could have uh they could have been like oh oscar's here oh look so's grunchetta get out of here because that's yeah, what it's exactly. like yeah well thank you for noticing <laughs> <laughs> did you did you ever actually see that film yeah oh yeah okay yeah it came out when i was a little too young like i was like six months old at the time so yeah, i didn't actually yeah. see it but I've seen it a couple of times since, and it's adorable. Yeah, it's a cute film. It's so cute, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Grungetta's appeared a lot in, like, street stories. Uh, do right. you have any favorite Grungetta episodes? Oh, I have a couple. Okay. There was one um, with Jerry Nelson played uh, Professor Piggins, mm-hmm. and um, it was My Fair Grouch. We did my, a takeoff on My Fair Lady, and Grungetta was the My Fair Lady. And um, <laughs> the opening, uh, Tracy Ullman, um talks about meeting professor piggins as well tracy allman does the opening with me we do this mm-hmm. really funny i want to be a grouch like tracy allman played a grouch mm-hmm. uh Grangetto wanted to be a grouch like her um so that's a pretty much a highlight um that's probably my favorite episode i ever did mostly because jerry was fantastic as professor yeah. piggins you know he was a great actor and a boy sky and jerry i adored with every he was just the best and most wonderful guy Mm. Um, him and Richard you know starting out with the two of them was heaven I mean they were just a wonderful um when I started with the company Frank was just 
Frank and Jim would come in just a couple of days, a week maybe of the season and do just all their stuff together. And that was fantastic. It was like watching them work together was a college education in performance and in how television works and how uh, comedy works. They were fantastic. But the day to day I was with Jerry and, and Richard and- Yeah, they were kind of like the in and out puppeteers. Yeah, uh, Jerry and Richard were just there and they were wonderful and funny and just great guys to to learn how to do this really bizarre art that we <laughs> we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, ca I can't believe that uh, this week has been 10 years since Jerry died this Tuesday. Yeah, it was heartbreaking. Oh, for me too, because like, like, uh, like you were there when Jim Henson passed away and when Richard passed away. And like I had heard people like Frank and Steve and Kevin and Joey Mazzarino and uh, a couple other people talking about what it was like that moment when Jim died. And it's like, well, that's just not, not only were they sad about it, but it was just such a shock. It's like, here's a guy that's got no problems with life whatsoever. He's always happy and smiling. And apparently from what I've heard has never been sick. And all of a sudden he's just gone. And like, right. I mean, I had heard that Jerry was ill and in declining health. Um, well, he was, he was what 70 something when he passed. So he was, he had been ill yeah. for a while. And I was with Jerry when he died, actually, actually with him. Oh. I was the Cape at the, happened to be at the Cape at that time. Oh. But it was nice. I, I, uh, I went to visit him that afternoon and he was in and out of consciousness. And I played oh. guitar for him because we used to play guitar and sing together. I used to go up and hear his concerts. Mm. So it was really sweet. I sang him a few songs and then uh, went out to dinner and then Jan called me that he had passed and we went back to the house and said goodbye. So, oh, God. Yeah, I think I, I'm not crying. You're crying. <laughs> oh, that is chilling. It was wow. beautiful. No, it was beautiful because it was time. Jerry needed to go. Mm. And there comes a time when people need to go. So, yeah, it was tough for me because the count was like the first Muppet I had ever seen on television and uh, when you were talking about what a great actor he was I was talking to my grandfather today on a dog walk this morning about actors who had really really big voices and yeah. Jerry definitely had one of those very very big voices where that it could go anywhere like um because he always picked someone in radio like the count was of course Bella Lugosi uh -huh. Harry my favorite Harry was uh Jimmy Durante Sherlock Hemlock I think was based on Basil Rathbone yeah. Mumford was W.C. Field. So, you know, at, so yeah, Jerry was definitely um, a great actor when it came to, right. in, and a good impressionist, really. That's the way I kind of view him when it comes to these characters. But he Very also had this incredible vocal resonance, you know, because some, he, his ability to sing and to create wonderful sounds with his voice was just mm. phenomenal. I mean, think about Robin, which is this little tiny frog character, and yeah. it was so sweet and clear and just somebody you just love that voice. I mean, he, and when you were in the room with him, it was unbelievably beautiful, his voice. His voice, yeah. all his voices were just incredible. Yeah, have you ever heard his CD? Yeah, I was there for the recording of it actually. Oh, cool, <laughs> cool. Yes. Yeah, my, my, uh, my grandfather used to sail and um, frequently when we used to sail, uh, I would play tides. If it was uh, a very, very smooth sail, like, yeah. We always reminisce about this very, very smooth sail where there was no, the water was rough, but we just kind of stayed on and continued doing what we were doing, but it was so quiet. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather calls me and he's like, somebody was asking me, what's the best time you've ever had on the water? And I said that. Yeah. And that, that, that was a nice feeling. And I, I did play that song that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, that was a great gift. Kevin Clash gave Jerry. He, he set that all up and I think he paid for all of it to be recorded and to do his album because Jerry never got his own album. Oh, yeah. um, Ke Kevin's the best. Kevin's the best. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a total. Uh, I, I met Kevin once. Kevin is a very, very generous human being. That definitely sounds like an act of generosity. With the with the favorite Grungetta episodes, uh, mine actually is one with Carol, but it's not with Oscar actually. It's, uh, and with summer coming to a close, what a perfect time to bring it up. Uh, how, how depressing for my mom because my mom's a teacher, so that means she has to go back to work. Uh, <laughs> sorry, mom. 
but uh, <laughs> it's where Big Bird makes a plan to go to the beach, but he's like, all I need is just an adult to take me. And Grungetta's like, yeah, something's gonna go wrong. I can't do Grungetta <laughs> as good as you. But That's pretty good. <laughs> thanks. Um, but uh, so basically every adult that Big Bird asks, can you take me to the beach? They're looking after a baby. <laughs> it's so, you know, Grungette is just happy that Big Bird's plans are going awry. <laughs> Big Bird's pissed off because he really wants to go to the beach. And he's like, oh, they, this is a very typical Big Bird kind of a thing um, for him to feel because if he felt left out, he was not, you know, he, he was a typical kid. He would be very, very upset about it. And so uh, he's, uh, he's um, talking to them about it. And uh, Grungette is chiming in. Uh, saying, uh, he probably thinks that you like those stupid, yucky babies more than him. Big Bird's like, well, I never said that. And Maria was like, but you do feel that, don't you? Yeah. So, yeah. So that, that was, was probably- good. Big feeling show. Yeah. It yeah. Was, yeah. Um, some of my other favorite episodes would be um, Oscar and I went on vacation to Camp Mushy Muddy. And... <laughs> I remember the song Swamp Mushy Muddy. Swamp yes. Mushy Muddy. And we and we sailed down on a on an old tire down the river of Mushy Muddy, and they created this river that we were on. And this old horrible tire floating down the river was quite funny. Is that that um, one uh, alone in the swamp? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think that was part of it. I don't know. You know, okay. um, Marty and I were just talking this past weekend about how many shows we've done and we were trying to figure it out. And I know I've done well over 2000 Sesame Street shows. And I think he's done 2,500 or something when we do the estimate of how many shows Sesame okay. Street shows we've been in or on. Um, so it gets a little muddy, camp mushy muddy. But the other one is- <laughs> No pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended, of course it was intended. Um, <laughs> uh, is we were gonna get married because there was that big wedding between um, uh, Luis and Maria. Mm -hmm. And so then we thought we would get married. And, um, and, we, and uh, we had, I had this whole fantasy scene of having a baby with Oscar. And we had Irvine at the time play the baby in the, in the fantasy scene. And then um, <laughs> we were about to get married and then we realized it might make us happy and grouches don't want to be happy. So we never got <laughs> married. So we didn't get married. Oh my God. <laughs> but I actually have a Grangetta bit that I do, you know, like when I do live things, I go, but we should have gotten married because I didn't realize that so many people are miserably married. We could have probably made that work. You know. <laughs> hey, Grangetta, how are you enjoying the hot weather? Oh, it's awful. It makes my, my fur smell moldy. I love it. Well, we've, well we, we've got a little bit of clouds here. You can come on down to Nova Scotia if you want. Oh, that would be good. I, I like the wet and the cold better than the hot and the smuggy. Smuggy. That's a mm. new word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> smoggy, muggy, smuggy. Um, no, I, I'm fine. I'm having a good time this summer. I'm actually, uh, you know, just hanging like mm. you do in That's the can. All. You know, I have my own can, right? We have... Yeah. We have separate cans, kind mm. of a candominium thing going. A candominium. <laughs> well, that's what we do, me and Oscar. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Pam, back to you. Uh, yeah. We were talking a little bit about uh, Oscar. That does kind of lead me into wondering, uh, what was Carol Spinney like? Oh, Carol was Carol was Big Bird and Carol was Oscar. And yeah. um, you can't say anything better about a human being than that. He was two sides of the coin. Mm. He really was, uh, he was a delight. And, um, you know, Carol and Debbie actually came to Hawaii a lot, a fair amount of time. And I would take them before I started, I would always meet them because of Kermit, I had met Carol. Mm -hmm. So Kermit came <clears throat> to teach at university. Carol stopped by during that time. So I, um, I met Carol then. And um, I would take them on tours of Hawaii, take them out to a restaurant or whatever they needed. Um, and uh, Debbie said to me, you know, you could work for the Muppets. Debbie was the one who put the idea in my head. And then Carol chimed in, yeah, yeah, come on. You'd be great in New York. Come come audition for the Muppets. Um, you know, they didn't have that so much So basically power. you went from being on a beach all day long to going to this big city. Yes, it was horrifying. I mean, moving <laughs> to the East Coast from Hawaii was shocking. 
to say the least. Um, it was 100% different than anything I knew. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very scary <laughs> initially. Um, of course, I was at the University of Connecticut, which was an easier transition. So I'd make little trips into New York and got used to New York. Eventually, I did have um, you know, an apartment in New York that I worked out of. And I also stayed uh, anchored to that area because I met my husband at the university and got married. So I was going back and forth for many years. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, Carol and Debbie were instrumental in getting me to at least audition, you know, um, it, Kermit too, Kermit, Kermit encouraged me as well. But I think it was Debbie's pushing, you know, they were just wonderful. And they've always been kind of a part of my, my family, my Sesame family heart, both of them. They're just, they were, they were just wonderful. And Carol was Carol. There's just no question. Carol said to me, my favorite thing is Oscar actually in, uh, we were at dinner and someone was not behaving well in the restaurant. Like and a Carol child or an adult? An adult was being very rude to the white person. Oh God, don't you just hate that? Yeah, everybody hates oh. that. And Carol looks down quietly and he says, you know, in Oscar's voice, of course. <laughs> yeah, if you don't want to be a murderer, you probably shouldn't hang out with people who should be killed. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> That's all he said. It made me laugh so hard. Well, what, what did the person do? The person didn't hear it. He said it to us at the table. Oh. Without there being terrible. <laughs> but uh, it was very funny. One of Oscar's words of advice. Mm. <laughs> Don't hang around people who should be killed. <laughs> um, you you were also talking a little bit about the uh, marriage of um, Luis and Maria, and yeah. how that kind of later came into Oscar and Grangetta deciding to get married, but then right. deciding, screw it, we'd be too happy. Uh, right. <laughs> what a great way to call off an engagement. We'd be too happy. <laughs> yeah, easy, easy way to break your heart. <laughs> so... Um, as, as we I'm didn't sure break up, we just didn't get married, you know. Mm, yeah. As I'm sure you've heard, as many, many other people from Sesame Street have, and I'm it was six months ago. I'm still not over it. We lost Emilio Delgado recently. Oh my god. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, that was uh that was a major, major blow for me. Cause like I was away in uh in Vancouver at the time, and my mom and I went on a little shopping trip. We were going it was with my dad's work. And we were going to um, to dinner with somebody that my dad works with that night. And so we were like, we got time. So we went around the city and um, she, I forget where we were, but I was kind of walking around and I was like, uh, I wonder if anybody texted me because I felt my phone uh, vibrate in my pocket. So I pulled out my phone and I was like, hey, you know what? As long as I'm answering this message, I might as well go to Instagram. And there was a picture of Emilio and it said that he passed on. And I just stopped right in the center of the store I was in, went to go find my mom. And I was like, mom, Emilio Delgado died. And I had just heard from him a couple of days before. No. Yeah. I, I never had him on nostalgia talk, but we communicated. And so I was like, oh my God. And I left the dinner early because I was like, okay, I need, I, I just need to be alone right now. It was, Oh God. It was very wow. hard for all of us. In fact, none of us knew he was sick. He didn't want any. Yeah. Like I immediately no. got, yeah, I got in touch with Norman and Lou and Molly Boylan, Joe Matthew, a couple other people from Sesame street that I know. I was like, Mila, Emilio Delgado passed away. And Norman uh, said, I just saw him a couple of months ago and didn't know that he had blood cancer. Oh, he didn't tell anybody. He did <sighs> not tell any of us. We, um, in fact, we were working, <clears throat> <clears throat> that morning and we got a call saying Emilio is very sick and he's on hospice so we were very upset oh, and then um Carol his wife said to us yeah uh said talk to us on a speakerphone in the dressing room and said yeah probably you know it probably it sounds really bad probably won't be long or something to that effect and um so we were all very sad, but we went back to work and we were, you know, thinking about it. And two hours later, we got a call that he had passed, oh, but he didn't want any of us to feel sorry for him. He didn't want any of us, which is why he never told any of us. We had seen him around the holidays. I think there was some event that we were all at. Was that and, the, um, um, was that the street gang premiere? Cause I think that's the event that been. Norman, I think that's the event that Norman was talking about. Cause I yeah, saw there a was, photo of them. Yeah. Yeah. There might've been a Sesame street thing that he okay. made because we you know we have christmas parties and stuff um that's and that's so fun 
and he yeah and it was just a shock for all yeah. of them you know well, because I, here's bob who's in his 90s so yeah you, you think in terms of who we might lose emilia was not the one that came to mind at all same same especially because yeah. i had just heard from him that week so oh wow that's really nice yeah yeah he was yeah, such, he just, yeah, such he was, a nice man yeah he was wonderful he was he was just who he was. He was just this sweet, wonderful guy, funny, you know, very talented. So uh, moving on from the sad stuff, um, let's get into something a little bit more happier. Um, okay. Another uh, thing you do on Sesame Street from time to time is quite often Telly's right hand. And I got to tell you, you really go above and beyond for Telly's right hand. Does that ever hurt your voice? <laughs> yeah, really. It's, it hurts my voice and my brain to be quiet. That's what it does. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Marty and I've been telly for like a well over 30 years. Um, and very often I know what he's going to do before he does in terms of movement. Mm -hmm. Being a right hand is a really interesting process. You, um, a good right hand you don't even know is there and you don't have to think about them and you don't have to tell them what to do. And they become a part of the character. And, but it takes a while to be a good right hand to not, um, to not be pulling down on the puppet, to not be weighting the, uh, the puppeteer down, to not be doing something that distracts the puppeteer, the, the head puppeteer from their performance. It's, it's an art. It's a super challenging art form and you get basically no credit for it. <laughs> you know, so it is really- Yeah, uh, it's usually, it's, it usually would be credited as additional puppeteers. Correct. Which, which is, is also known as puppeteers who are holding up a right hand, making sure that the coordination is the same. Right, exactly. I was, um, I, was talk I was talking to Bruce Lanoyle this week, oh. and um, he was talking, because he's been doing right hands for, oh my God, 30 years at least. And, you know, he's like, sure, I've never been a big Muppet star, but I've but a right hand isn't nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very tough thing. I've actually right-handed for Bruce Lanoyle. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. When we did the Wobulous World of Dr. Seuss, he was the, uh, he was the Seuss character the first season, and Marty was the second. Right. So um, I right handed both of those guys. Um, <laughs> well, with Marty, you know, you two have worked so long that you'd be used to his kind of performance. Like, you know, yeah. Wh uh, yeah. where he's going to go with it. So it's easy for you to follow along. I'm not yeah. saying it's not like that with Bruce, but you've worked. No, it was it was more challenging with Bruce, for sure. Okay. And every every new puppeteer, you have to sort of study what they do and how they do yeah. it. In I'm, order just, try, I'm just trying to make it not sound like I'm talking crap about puppeteers. <laughs> no, 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 you're not. They should, they, yeah. they should start a TMZ with puppeteers, like where they're talking crap about puppeteers. Like, oh, did you hear where this guy was? I wonder what they were filming. Oh, who's the new performer of uh, this person? Yeah, yeah, we don't need that. <laughs> yeah, that's the last thing any of you guys need, more added pressure. No, no, we don't need that. Um, the, uh, that's, that, that's what this podcast is for. <laughs> No, I'm just, I'm, I'm it's, just, it's, a, it's, it's challenging. Um, and you know, as, as the pool of puppeteers gets larger, which is what it's doing right now, I think it, that will change a little bit. I don't know. You know, there's a lot of new puppeteers in Los Angeles and there's a fair number of new ones coming into New York from all over the country. Um, and it is sort of changing Sesame Street, we're, we're pretty much a big family and always have been, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, yes, you don't get along with members of your family, of course, there are times when you have disagreements with members of your family, so it really is like a big family. Um, uh, as, as Henson in LA grows, I'm not sure how much of that family feeling can stay consistent because they're, they're getting really big and yeah. that does change. So we'll, we'll see, I mean, I know pretty much the main folk out there pretty well, but um, it's changing, you know, mm -hmm. life changes, we go on. <laughs> so um, you've been with Sesame Street for about, as, I, as, as we were saying, about 40 years. And not only have you gotten to do Grungetta and a bunch of recurring characters, but in that time, you've also gotten to do a lot of characters that just appeared one time and one time only. Are yeah. there any of them that just kind of have stuck out in your memory all this time? Wow, that's a tough one. I've done a lots of odd little girls who've mm -hmm. been sort of my favorite. Mm -hmm. One of them just wanted to be with her daddy. Can I have my dad, please? I want to dance with my daddy. 
It was a it was a fat blue character with fuzzy hair who who only wanted to dance with her daddy, and I think that's really a funny quirky thing. But then you know they disappear. But I have been a ton of dogs and cats and rats and bats. Many bats, batty bats were some of my favorite things that we did. There's oh this- really? Were, were you yeah. in the song the batty bat? Yeah. Daddy, oh. daddy, bat, batty, batty, bat. That one, song? two, yeah. three, count. That's one of yeah. my very favorite Sesame yeah, Street yeah. songs. Doing the batty bat. Yeah, I was one yeah. of the bats. So really? that was always a favorite thing to do um, and challenging because they're just little things on wire. And so you have to make them look good. Mm-hmm. Um, that's been very fun. You know, and just, just talk. Yeah, no, nobody. Lots and lots of things. Nothing standing out at the moment. But. Okay. <laughs> So those. what's that? Besides those, lots of right hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tell, mostly tellies. <laughs> mostly tell everybody though. I yeah. was Kermit's knees. I've been Kermit's elbows. I've been lots. I assisted Jim a fair amount in those early days when he was on, mm-hmm. um, you know, and worked with pretty much every puppeteer at some point. I've done their right hand in the show. That's just how it goes, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. You, that's yeah that is that's that's the way that's just the way it is da 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 da, da, da. little nostalgic tune there um moving I'm on doing a new character actually um anti oh. bird who's a Hawaiian character big bird's anti we did a series called um Sesame Street Beginnings and it mm-hmm. was like the baby characters it was baby big bird it was baby cookie monster it was baby um I right think- I think baby's maybe baby prairie dawn was yeah it. it was yeah yeah um but anyway i did uh big bird's caregiver auntie nani bird mm-hmm. and um so recently she's made a recurrent that was about 12 years ago 13 years ago mm-hmm. um she's re just we just did a new show with her uh, this year so she's oh. back and i just did this week we just did a an insert a heritage uh, word of the day, I think it was, um, was um, tradition. So nice. um, I just did a, a show with her on that. So that's fun to bring that back. Awesome. Um, yeah. And, I re- yeah and, I, re- I do remember Sesame Beginnings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. A, that was a good, good video series. We had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Challenging, but fun. Mm-hmm. And they were cute as hell. God, they were cute little characters. Yeah, they really were. <laughs> yes. Just darling little baby Big Bird. And that was Matt. I think Matt was baby Big Bird in that one. Yep. And now, and now he's real big bird. <laughs> now he's real big bird. Yeah, Carol was training him. I mean, you kind of do that. You get to a certain age, which maybe I'm at, um, where you start thinking about who's going to take over what you do. You know, mm-hmm. if you leave, what happens to your character? You don't want your character to disappear. You'd like it to continue in some form. So you start, it's a legacy thing. You know, it's not many shows have that luxury of thinking about legacy. Yeah, yeah, like people still ask me, you know, Sesame Street's still on, and I was like, oh yeah, they're still making new stuff because these are people who are either older than me, my age, or oh, my parents' age. Yeah, and or who, younger. Even yeah. younger people don't know it's on because unless you have little kids or you're a fan, yeah, uh, <laughs> you don't you don't watch it. You know, mm-hmm. you stop watching it when you stopped watching it. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where we're at with that. It's very mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, I also do the live walk around shows. I direct yes. the shows all over. Mm-hmm. So we're putting together a few of those that are going down to beaches and um, nice. Turks and Caicos in Jamaica, in Turks and Caicos in Jamaica. Uh, and also we're putting in a new show at Sesame Place. Sesame Place has started doing, um, they have a, a our street and they actually have puppets in it as well as walk a big bird as a walk around Mm -hmm. so um the last two shows the last show i directed and then um this show that we're doing a halloween show that's going in uh the second week of september so cool on yeah that's 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 awesome uh have you ever directed on sesame street at all uh not on sesame street i've directed for um ubi and for between the lions oh i didn't know about between the lions i knew yeah i did a couple of um when we were doing stuff after this, after the final season, we did a few things. I directed a couple of things that went out to schools and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, and I direct live shows as well. So I do a lot of live show directing. Cool. Um, So it's nice. It's good. It's a great way to, to continue loving what I do. (laughs) 
Well, when it comes to Sesame Street, because uh, that show in the 50 plus years that it's been around, you know, they've covered some pretty, you know, heavy stuff or they've done some things that are really like the kind of thing you wouldn't expect a kid's show to do, like the death of Mr. Hooper, uh, Miles being adopted, Luis and Maria starting their family, like marriage and starting family. Um, uh, I think John Weidman wrote an episode where Hooper's store caught fire in response to um, the attacks in New York. Uh Um, Has there ever been a moment uh, when you were on the set of Sesame Street that you're just there and you're like, oh my God, I just feel so happy to be a part of this show? Almost every day. Um, That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Almost every day I see something and say, yeah, I think we're making a difference. Mm, I think the so days too. that I don't feel that way, I'm, I'm pretty sad. Um, mm. You know, I don't, I'm a person, I don't want to be doing something that I don't feel is moving our culture, our society, our human life forward. That's my, that's my ultimate duty, I feel, yeah. is to, to help move, um, you know, to improve an ever evolving society is what I want to be doing. So pretty much every day, that we do something special like that, that then it's super happy. But every day I go in and I, I, I appreciate and I am grateful for being there mm-hmm. because I don't know anyone else who's had the life I've had. You know, mm-hmm. I've had a great life. Repres- I've had Repres- children Repres- and houses yeah. and all this stuff thanks to Sesame Street, as well as helping children learn to read and understand and negotiate how difficult this life is. Yeah. I, I, my hope is that we made it a little better, a little easier, a little clearer. Well, you all, know, we did it. Huh? I was going to say to all of you listeners out there, what do you think? Has Sesame Street made a difference in your life? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, we approach, we have been known to approach difficult subjects at, right in the thick of it. And that's, that's a very challenging thing to do as a public television show, right? because people don't approve you know when sesame started there were states that didn't want the show because Mm -hmm. they showed an integrated cast and they didn't want it on their tvs Mm -hmm. you go back to the early days so we've always been tried to be in the forefront of what is helping to make our society better um and i'm very proud to have been a part of that all these years you know as we continue down that path that's nice they did introduce a, a, a gay family yeah, yeah. After years and years of people speculating that Bert and Ernie were in a relationship. They weren't. I mean, yeah. that, that's wrong. They're puppets. Yeah, yeah that, that's exactly what I tell them. They're puppets. Uh, what but are you that, thinking? Take your mind out of the gutter. Exactly. But that is so, and, and my sister is, uh, a me- I, I, I had her on a YouTube video with her girlfriend, so I can safely say that she's a member of the LGBTQ community. Uh-huh. Um, so when I heard that Sesame Street had a gay family, I think I texted her, they, 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 got, they got a gay family on Sesame Street now. So, that, and that really helps make it so diverse. Well, and it helps, helps children negotiate what's going on around them. That's what it's that about. Too, yeah, exactly. You know, there are families that are not the same as your family. Yeah. And, and you can't treat them, you can't make them other, you can't treat them any differently. You know, acceptance is the only way that all of us move forward. Mm-hmm. You know, it, and trying to understand each other the best we can. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just the way we are. Yeah. But truly, you know, so I am very proud of my association with Sesame Street for all these years. Yeah. Screw the haters. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so moving on from uh, from Sesame Street on to uh, some other stuff, because you've worked with the Disney Muppets uh, you, a couple of times. You've done like Little Muppet Monsters. Right. And uh, Muppet Christmas Letters to Santa, which was yeah. uh, on location. What was that like? Oh, you- that was lots of fun. Yeah, um, I bet. Yeah. It was in the biggest studio. It was like a giant airplane hangar. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, we had all these different guest stars and it was really fun to have everybody in New York at doing a Christmas show a little before Christmas, of course. I was going to ask you when it was shot. You know, I think it was like October. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. But so it was cool. I remember we were wearing sweaters and stuff. So, but it was just fun. It was a great fun build up to Christmas time. And I, and, uh, and, uh, you know, just wonderful. Always working with Dave Goltz is just such a pleasure. He's such a brilliant performer and an interesting yeah. guy. I love him so much. And then it was all our regular guys, you know, it was Matt and 
it was just really fun. It felt a lot like the old days and that was wonderful, you know, mm -hmm. to feel back in the old days of all that. How yeah, because I think happened. that I think that was one of the first times that Matt took on Jerry's characters, and one of the first time that David took on Richard's Muppet Show characters. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I, I totally know what you mean because uh, now they were becoming regulars again, and um, the Muppets were starting to make some. Right. Yeah. Out. You know, because they've been dormant for so long. You right. Know, yeah. That, that's what Bruce and I were talking about the other day. It's just they've just been nobody you know kids don't know who they are because they just <clears throat> my kids did of course because they had to watch them up at show as children but because i you know i had it all taped but most kids had no idea who these characters are and i do think that's part of the problem even with disney knowing what to do with them mm -hmm. since they don't have a built-in uh audience the way other characters do they have to reintroduce them in a in a in another way so i think that's what these these shows have been the new shows over and over is trying to figure out a, the best way to reintroduce the Muppets and connect them to the current audience. Um, and I'm hoping the new show will do that too. I mean, mm -hmm. it's always, it's just great to have those characters around again, you know? It's yeah. Really wonderful. Did you see uh, Muppets Haunted Mansion on Disney plus? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Was that, really that was great. Special that was. Effects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice. Special mm -hmm. effects wise. Yeah. So, so on, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, uh, I was going to bring up uh, Between the Lions, finally. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a show that I, and I see Leona behind you. Yeah, there she is. Yeah. Uh, what's that cord there? That's her uh, control. Okay, cool. This is how I work her eyes. Okay. Yeah, I've, see, I've seen puppets with that before. I was kind of wondering how that works. I mean, it's a podcast, so I don't know. that She has a, a control built by Jim Krupa, I might add. Mm -hmm. that's one of the best in the business so it just yeah I, you know, I know that none of the listeners can see it but i can that she's uh working the eyes of the puppet for me so cool it's on the, it's on the rod hand so a lot mm -hmm. of times when you have a, a a control like her ears and her eyes work and both of them are on the nice. raw hand so i can work her by myself lots of times when you have a character that has moving parts like ears or eyes or tails or whatever you have to have a second puppeteer Leona mm -hmm. is wonderful because I can just do her by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, she is one of my favorite characters I've ever done. Mm -hmm. It was just so much fun. It was such a great cast. Yeah. How, did, how, did, how did you get that character? Because it was Kathy Mullins first. Right. Um, Kathy Mullen and Michael had decided they wanted to do different projects. And, and so um, they were leaving the show. And so uh -huh. uh, Leona was, they called for an audition for Leona and I went in and um, I made sure, I asked Kathy if it was okay with her because she's a very, very dear friend of mine. Um, mm -hmm. If it was okay if I auditioned for Leona that, it, that I, you know, if I take it over, would she be all right with that? And she said, yes. And then I went in and auditioned mm -hmm. and um, I knew the character well. I love Kathy's character. So I did my best version of Kathy doing uh, Leona. And I was leaving and I'm thinking, oh, I don't think I got it. They're gonna get someone else. And before I even was out the door of the building that I was auditioning and they called me and told me, come back in, we want you to do the part. So I was very happy to get it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we did, I think two seasons in New York and then we moved out uh, then, and then about four, five seasons out in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. at Mississippi Public Television, and those were all super happy days. Um, you know, it was it was Tim Legasse, it was Peter Lintz, it was Jen Barnhart, myself, Heather Ash, um, Jim Krupa was there for part of it. Uh, it was just fun. It was yeah. just a super fun group. The other super fun group like that would be Allegra's Window, mm -hmm. which, oh my God, we had so much fun doing that show. Mm -hmm. A lot of the shows, I mean, I, I've been really lucky. Um, I think the great space coaster was incredibly fun for the times. And then we had Eureka's castle, which was just, yes, which just tons of fun and Eureka's castle. We also went to Florida to do uh, Allegra's window was in Florida. Uh, my kids thought everybody goes to Florida for four months a year. <laughs> <laughs> they probably would have thought, Oh, you go to Florida to be a star. I thought it was Hollywood. No, they thought that they thought that they, we're entitled to four months at Disneyland and at Universal Studios because that we, you know, we basically got in for free. The kids were there 
they were little. My youngest son was six, maybe. And he <laughs> turned to me and and said, Mommy, when do we go back to Florida for, for a bunch of time? And I go, when well, Mommy gets a job. But, <laughs> 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 but I mean, really, literally, they thought all kids went to Florida for long periods of time to go to the parks, uh, of course. Um, yeah, that, so that, that, it was that a great sounds time. Like so, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, oh, the, fact that fun. the fact that it's it at Disney fun. World, yeah. Yeah, um, mm. I mean, literally, because I was, we were shooting on Universal Studios, the kids, I had, well, my mother came at one point and babysat when the baby was, a, when my son was an infant, because I started um, Allegra's Window. Yeah, it was Allegra's Window. I started when Luke, my youngest son, was six months old. So um, my mother came and took care of the baby while I was on set, and then she would walk him around the parks. So she's in she's in a lot of the background of the shows where we have group scenes. <laughs> There's my mother and my son in the background. That's funny. <laughs> but um, and going to Disney World, I mean, you know, that's yeah, gotta be. Of course, yeah. On the weekends, we'd go to Disney World, and then we've also shot things. And in, in I've shot things in Disneyland with Muppets. We did some of the I forget what, but. So we've done, um, yeah, we've done stuff at both things. And Disney, we had a kind of reciprocal relationship, you know, because I was at work with the Muppets. So you can, you know, so we would get in a lot. We went a lot. We got mm. full season passes to both places that's, anyway. That's fun. Um, so I haven't been there in years because I haven't had a job down there in years. But <laughs> um, I was just thinking I would like to go back down. I I have a friend that's there for vacation right now. So yeah, mm. yeah. Well, that's what us, we do, right? <laughs> but yeah, with the uh, with Between the Lions, like that show and Sesame Street as well. Like I watched a lot of PBS. I don't know if you can see my shirt. Oh yes, it's a PBS shirt. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I oh. I actually got this the day after I heard from you about doing this show, and I and I looked at I was at a uh, I was at an Urban Outfitters saw that and I looked at the work and I was like. I, can I have a change room so I can try this on? Nice. <laughs> and wow. Your so, celebration shirt, great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, between the lions, like when I I, I interviewed Chris Surf a while oh, back. Oh God, and, one of the best. Yes. Oh hell yeah! And um, I knew that we had to talk about between the lions. Like it's obligatory. We absolutely had to talk about between the lions. And um, so I went to YouTube. I had a. I was still in college, doing school from home because of the pandemic. And uh, I went to YouTube before my class, typed in Between the Lions, and I see Click the Mouse. Go, I tell the story a lot on the podcast, but I see Click the Mouse going through right, in the, right at the start, and it's starting to look familiar. And then I'm hearing the rest of the song, hey, now, hey, wow, here's how. And so I'm noticed, and so I see the lions all kind of spelling the words. Finally, it gets that really jazzy gospel right. sound, and I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> why <laughs> because it was just so nostalgic for me i was like oh, oh my god i remember this yeah just been so freaking long since i'd seen it it was yeah. oh my god yeah yeah and norman um, yes. and norman actually introduced me to uh another uh show that you worked on lomax the hound of music oh yes lomax was fun we had yeah. a great time on lomax yeah mm -hmm. i yeah. uh i saw i saw an episode that you actually were in as uh as a human character and yeah Yep, I, I forget what that one. Yeah. yeah, and I, all I remember about it was the song "There Ain't No Bugs on Me." There ain't no bugs, and I thought that was just so cute. Like I on, on some, some of your buds, buds but there ain't yeah. no bugs on me. Yeah, yeah it's that it, that's, that's a cool show. Yeah, yeah, very unknown because oh yeah, um, it just I think it aired one season and mm, and just sucks. in a few places, but. But you know that's what happens. Showbiz, showbiz. You know, mm. so sometimes yeah. it goes, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, now with Eureka's Castle going on to that, do you have any favorite moments from Eureka's yeah. Castle? God, Eureka's Castle was just so much fun. Um, from how you describe it, it definitely sounds like it was so much fun. It was so much fun, and we were so crazy. And um, <laughs> and it, you know, Noel, um, it was it was another great crew you know it's noel and jim krupa and uh brian meal and i and lynn hippen and um cheryl blaylock just a wonderful team of people uh and again you know when it's that small group and you're just struggling to make it all happen it's just it's the best it makes you a family it makes you very close together and uh you know i the second season i think 
I was pregnant with my son while I, mm -hmm. uh, my son, Nick, my oldest son, and um, Brian Meal's wife was pregnant at the same time. So you all talk about it's all the women he was with were pregnant and he was like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> and, besides, uh, besides the fact that you both did Grungetta, you and Brian seemed to have a lot to talk about. Yeah, we did. It was very and I mean, fun. you know, Bog and Quagmire being together, so. <laughs> and he would always say to me, I'd be talking about what we should be doing. And he'd look at me and go, I'm sorry, what did you say? I thought you were my wife. <laughs> <laughs> He's an incredibly funny man. I love that guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he is a very funny guy. Yeah. He's a great guy. So, yeah. yes, that was lots of fun. Um, yeah. Bog mm -hmm. and Quagmire were two of really fun characters. And Emma Mouse, I love doing my little fat mouse. Mm, yum food you know <laughs> close to my heart i like yeah. my food <laughs> I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta tell you with the name quagmire it always makes me think of family guy have you ever watched family guy yes yes i quagmire. was mad that they took her name yes quagmire <laughs> is, is not a nice guy <laughs> on that show oh my god like my favorite moment with that character was where he was playing golf made a little stroke and had a profane meltdown mm-hmm yeah, that's uh, but uh, yeah, your your quagmire is definitely a lot very sweeter. different, yeah. very different than so quagmire. many ways, but also kind of grouchy. I sort of got, I don't know, I get all the grouch women, <laughs> yeah, Grangetta, quagmire. Leona wasn't really grouchy, no, but... Leona was the sweetest of sweet. She was, yeah, very, very you, mean, you mean like you, <laughs> very fitting. I don't know, I'm a little bit about there, me and Carol. <laughs> <laughs> both well, sides you, of the coin <laughs> well then you two definitely worked well together then in a case yeah, like that yeah, but was i was very... I, I mean i've never been to the set of sesame street so i can't really say that i've ever seen that kind of a connection so yeah i mean no. i can see it in oscar and grudgetta but those are just the characters you're doing so right therefore but it you, works. you develop you know that was the thing jim and frank had an amazing chemistry that's why everything they did together was hysterical mm -hmm. if, you know like there's just no you know the actual relationship is reflected in the work that we do mm -hmm. um you know and that's just the way it is i uh, i never seen anybody as as interesting or funny as what jim and frank would do together you know and and they would bug each other they would rib <laughs> each other they would poke fun at each other they were like brothers yeah yeah it was great it was a great mm -hmm. time. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, when you were on set when Jim and Frank would be performing their characters, was there ever any time that you were laughing so hard, like choking on what you're drinking, laughing, basically? Well, because you can't laugh out loud during a take. You have to leave the room. So you were always putting your hands over your mouth and turning away. You know, that's what I remember doing, trying to get back into the dressing room so I could laugh out loud because you just, you know, you couldn't do it. Not that I can remember specifically what it was, but they that's were... Okay. They were the best. They were the best at, at just saying something off, not on script, just brought it in. Mm -hmm. You know, it was yeah. Just em em Emily Kingsley told me that when they put those puppets on, they were those characters. Yeah, they were. They didn't. Mm -hmm. They didn't break character very much. Yeah. Did you Did you happen to see the Street Gang documentary? Yes. Okay. Then you then you know that there's a moment in that where Jim and Frank are doing Bert and Ernie, and it's nighttime. And Ernie's like, gee, Bert, it's, it's too bad you couldn't come to the park and play with me. And Bert responds, yeah, yeah, me too, Ernie. Ernie immediately says, um, Bert, you, you said me too. That didn't follow what I just said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so John Stone calls cut and they have to do it again. Okay. Good, night, er Good night, Ernie. Me too, Bert. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that. that they intentionally yeah. tried to throw each other off. It's hilarious. They did it all the time. Mm -hmm. It was lots of fun. Yeah. So fun. let's let's wrap it up by talking a little bit about Ubi. Um, okay. I've, I've seen Ubi here and there. I don't think it ever really aired. I don't think it aired in Canada, but I oh, have. Oh, maybe it didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Sucks. But uh, yeah, I I clearly missed out on it. But it's really really clever because yeah. you know a traditional puppet show like Sesame Street, Muppets, Fraggle Rock, Eureka's Castle, Between the Lions. It's cloth on their hands. For this one, it's their actual human hands or in Noel and Cheryl's case, their feet. Um, <laughs> Noel told a little story about when he was doing a foot with Cheryl's foot character. Yes, right. Um, so when you were directing, did you find that a little bit difficult directing uh, the show just by, uh, just, just because no, for that because, reason? No, it's the same thing. It, okay. Cloth doesn't determine what the puppet is. Right. A puppet can be anything. So that was not an issue. And they're great actors, all of them, you know, uh, Tyler Bunch being Grandpa always cracked me up. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
and uh, it was a joy to, to work on that show. Marty, Marty made, Marty and I think Kathy McCullough assisted and made all, Marty Robinson and Kathy McCullough made the eyes, um, all those eye characters. And it was fun. It, we had a company together. We had done all the building for the props and everything else as well. In fact, I still have a box over there full of little tiny hair pieces. You've and, got quite the stash. <laughs> of, and eyeballs and hair pieces, you know, eyeballs and a little collar, whatever we were putting on to make them uh, feel more like a, a full, you know, a, a full person. Um, no, it was a joy to work on that show. It was lots of fun. We, you know, we, we um, did lots of outdoor things, which was nice. We did a fair cool. amount of location, which was very interesting to see those human hands with eyeballs on location, you know. Um, that was a very fun, interesting show to do. And the language, the language choices in that it was minimal language because it was aiming at being with with children who have minimal language and learning to communicate right. with that minimal language. Yeah, I kind of noticed that. I kind of noticed that with what I was watching of it, that they basically talk like, um, uh, "Hey, play ball," that kind of a thing, yeah, as right. if he's saying, "Would you like to play ball?" Something Correct. like that. Yeah. Correct. They. It was. It was the the intention. Josh Selig, who who wrote it and and developed created the show, um, wanted a show because he noticed that many kids don't have full language. So what if these characters also didn't have full use of language that you're learning to use full language and that became part of who they were. So that's why the language is very um, sparse. And it's interesting to be able to act and move your hand to create a whole character with the most minimum language. It forces you to be more creative with your movement. So that made it really fun to work on and to do, yeah. Yeah, it definitely looked like a fun series. And yeah. I love doing outdoor stuff too. Like, yeah, um, it's, it's a different, location is hard, but it's, yeah. it's really beautiful. Yeah, um, like on, on From, uh, the show I'm working on, um, we have two sets, one is outdoor, one is indoor. And I actually went to the outdoor set most of the week. I actually did watch them film something that I, I wish I could talk about, because it, it was so cool to actually watch it. Um, it, and, uh, you know, just outdoors in this tiny, tiny Nova Scotia community and then getting to check out the indoor sets that we have in Dartmouth. They look so good. Yeah, nice. Oh, they look so Well, good. we'll see it soon enough, I'm sure. And then you yeah. can tell us all about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Pam, that's uh, all I've got. Uh, is there any, and I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Is there anything else you'd like to say? No, just thank you very much. It's nice to know that there are people who still remember <laughs> what we've done all these years <laughs> <laughs> well to you listeners out there episode number 50 will be coming soon featuring drum roll fran brill wow awesome she's another, great yeah another big sesame street star very much so so i've had you marty billy uh who else leslie and now fran brill yep that's great yeah so all right to, to all you listeners peace Thank you. Bye-bye.